Today we're going to fool around with a cheap one-cylinder air-cooled diesel engine. More specifically, we're going to do some alternative fuel testing. So, as you can see, the weather outside isn't great and the roads are a bit sketchy. So, I think we'll leave the Kubota-powered Honda Insight here and focus our attention on what's in this box. So, this box arrived a few weeks ago and it's something I've been waiting to fool around with. But, I've been way too busy doing other things and now we have a chance to see what's inside the box. And it looks like we have another box. Okay, well give me a moment and I'll get this one opened up so we can see what's inside. And there you go, a brand new engine that we can play around with. Let's see, oh. Diesel engine power. So this little guy is a 196cc 3 horsepower diesel engine. Now check this out, I only paid $103 for it. Yeah, that's crazy. Just over a hundred bucks for a diesel engine, but I also had to pay $70 shipping, so all said and done it was $180 total. Still quite a bargain. Now some of you may be asking, why so cheap? Well, this engine has some issues. You see the output shaft on this engine's 20 millimeter. Now here in the colonies, metric measurements mean nothing, because we never got the memo. Anyway, let me do a quick translation. Okay, so 20 millimeters equals 0.787 of an inch. Now, most small engines that I'm familiar with will have a 0.75 or 3 quarter inch output shaft. And as you can see, this output shaft is 37 thousandths too big. Now, this extra thick output shaft makes this engine NFG as a direct replacement. The right way to solve this issue is to remove the crank and machine the output shaft on a lathe. The wrong way to solve this problem is to get the engine running and then take a file to the shaft while it's spinning. Now, this is a terrible idea, but there are plenty of folks who do this. Fortunately for our experiments, we can leave the shaft alone. It's not going to be much of an issue at all. So diesel engines are both simple and complex. This engine is pretty much just like all other small engines, except it's a diesel, and that means it has fuel injection. On this engine, the fuel injection is completely mechanical, and I find it fascinating that they were able to include a precision fuel injection system at this price point. Now, this is an inexpensive engine for sure, and while it has fuel injection, it doesn't have an oil pump. So yeah, the high stress parts inside this engine rely on splash lubrication. Meh, it seems to work, but it's more likely without an oil pump, this engine's going to huck a rod through the sidle block before the cylinder wears out. I guess only time will tell. Okay, so for our experiments, we're going to mount this engine to this test stand. Now in past videos, we've used this stand for some experiments, and it's really quite handy. This test stand features an alternator from one of my old Cadillacs. You know, the car is long gone, but its alternator still lives on. Anyway, the alternator, of course, generates voltage, and on this rig, we can dump all the power into this 1,500-watt load bank. What? Yes, watts. 1,500 of them. So that loosely calculates to about 2 horsepower, or in other words, this rig can absorb 2 horsepower from a small engine. Actually, when you factor in the less than ideal alternator efficiency, we're closer to 2.5 horsepower. The exact horsepower it can absorb doesn't really matter. With this load switching box, we can dial in whatever load we want for our test, and the load will remain the same throughout the test. And that's the main feature of this rig. So fast forward a bit, and I have the little diesel engine mounted on the stand. At this point, I need to deal with the odd-sized output shaft so I can mount this drive pulley. So this is the pulley hub that we use on this test stand. It's actually made for a 1 inch shaft and we typically use a 3 quarter to 1 inch adapter bushing in it. So this is the 3 quarter to 1 inch bushing and we need to increase the inside diameter from 0.75 to 0.787. And for that, I'm going to mount this bushing in the lathe and drill it out with this 20 millimeter drill bit. This is a bit sketchy, but future Jimbo said it works fine, so we got that going for us. Okay, so everything's machined to about the right size, so let's finish assembling this rig. Alright, we have fuel in the tank and we're ready to start the engine for the first time. I ended up taking the cooling shroud off because there's actually something rubbing underneath. It's not a big deal and I'll have a closer look off camera. In order to get this engine to fire off, we need to purge the fuel injection system of any air, and for that I'll loosen this nut at the fuel injector. 
Now I can spin the engine over with a drill. Now this is just a cheapo drill and it doesn't have the power to actually spin this engine over with full compression. So I'll have to hold on to the compression relief handle while I spin the engine over. And there you go. The fuel has worked its way through the high pressure pump and now we can tighten the injector nut and start the engine. Oh, it also helps to put the throttle at its maximum position when purging the fuel system. You'll thank me later. All right, let's see if this thing will run. You know, it didn't take long for this stinky little engine to fill the shop with obnoxious fumes. So I rolled the test stand outside and let the engine run for an hour or so. That should be good enough to break the engine in, you would think. Now it ain't exactly warm outside, but this little engine just kept chooching and chooching no problem. You know, this is somewhat alarming, but after an hour or so of running, this engine is still ice cold. Eh, I'm sure that'll be fine. Off camera I welded a bung to the exhaust manifold so we can install a thermal couple and track the exhaust gas temperatures with a K-type probe. It'll be interesting to see if different fuels affect the exhaust gas temperatures. For a tachometer, I'm using this $18 digital tack that I got from the jungle site. This gauge is meant to be used on things like drill presses or lathes. However, we used the exact same gauge on the diesel power Saturn last year with good results. And at $18, it's a cheap solution. This magnet that came with the tachometer kit is way too big, and on our setup we used the big washer and drilled a little hole in it and installed a smaller magnet. I used the punch to stake the magnet into the washer, so there's no worries about the magnet falling out. The bracket I made for the proximity sensor is basically just a bunch of scrap steel that was welded together to make a stable stand for the sensor. Keep in mind, with this diesel engine, the test stand vibrates quite a bit. Let's take a look at the instrument package. Up here we have the tachometer display, and over here we have the exhaust gas temperature display. And this is the voltmeter, and right next to it is the amp meter. For the fuel flow measurements, we're going to be using this graduated cylinder. Now, in retrospect, this method of measuring fuel flow is way too small, and we really should be sampling a larger volume. Meh, you learn as you go. For the first round of testing, we're going to run the engine on regular diesel fuel to gather some baseline data. After that, we're going to mix up a batch of vegetable oil and diesel fuel at a 50-50 ratio. Now, full disclosure, I did absolutely zero research on this experiment before starting it. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. Fast forward a bit and the engine's up and running. Actually, at this point, the engine's been running for over an hour under a load. The mini fuel tank needs to be topped off every 20 minutes or so. The governor on this engine is set to approximately 2500 RPM and it seems to be stable and we're pulling 53 amps from the alternator. If we take the current that's being generated by the alternator and multiply that by the voltage, well that loosely calculates to about one horsepower for a load. So basically we're absorbing one third the power that this engine can theoretically generate. Now even though it's cold outside, the load bank is generating quite a bit of heat and it's not a good idea to touch the power resistors. I'm talking to you, Jimbo. The load box is indicating three out of the six load resistors are engaged. So like I said, this test rig has been running for over an hour and now I'm ready to do some measuring. Oh, the exhaust gas temperature is impossible to read, but it's hovering at around 402 degrees Fahrenheit and it's stable. So this engine obviously runs fine on diesel fuel. Now let's take a look at how much fuel it consumes with the engine at one third load. On this test rig, the governor automatically holds the engine speed to about 2500 RPM. If there's any differences in the fuel, well, the governor will increase or decrease the amount of fuel that's being injected in order to keep the engine at 2500 RPM. This is a simple feedback system that keeps the engine at a constant speed. Anyway, it looks like the engine consumed 30 cc's of diesel fuel in 3 minutes and 23 seconds. Let's see how the vegetable oil compares. In order to do a fuel changeover, we have to work quickly because it's pretty cold today and I don't want the engine temperature to drop to ambient. So first I have to shut off the three power resistors, then turn off the load bank fans, and then finally shut off the alternator. 
At this point, I can shut the engine off. Now, to do this, I manually force the governor arm over. Doing it this way allows us to keep the throttle settings unchanged. Anyway, then I have to drain whatever fuel is remaining in the tank and the lines. Fortunately, this doesn't take long. Then I can add the vegetable oil diesel fuel mix to the little fuel tank and then purge the plastic fuel lines of any air. Now I can restart the engine and resume testing. Since we're switching over from diesel to diesel vegetable oil, well, there's still a little bit of pure diesel in the injector pump and that makes restarting the engine easy. Now some of you may be wondering about the fuel in the fuel return line. Well, as it turns out, the fuel in the return line isn't very much over the course of an hour, so we're not going to factor it in on any of the tests. It basically amounts to a few drips and it's nearly impossible to measure. Alright, here I overexpose the camera so we can get a better look at the gauges, and here you can see the alternators putting out 53 amps with the diesel vegetable oil mix. Just for fun, I'm going to engage two more load resistors and jump the current up to about 95 amps, which is almost double the load, and mathematically that's about two-thirds the rated horsepower this engine can generate. Now I'm impressed because doing this on a six and a half horsepower gasoline engine makes a huge difference in the way the engine sounds but on this little diesel engine, it handles it no problem. And on top of that, it's running off a 50-50 mix. Okay, well let's check the fuel consumption of this 50-50 mix. Now keep in mind, at this point the engine has been running for well over a half hour and everything has stabilized. Now with the 50-50 mix, the exhaust gas temperatures are exactly the same as the straight diesel fuel and that's something I didn't expect. So diesel fuel is made for diesel engines and vegetable oil is made for cooking. Using vegetable oil or any other fuel in this engine has the potential to cause damage to the injector pump, the injectors, or even the engine itself. On this test rig, well, I couldn't care less about any potential damage. However, on our test vehicles, I'm a bit concerned and probably wouldn't try this experiment. So it looks like on the 50-50 mix, it took 3 minutes and 35 seconds to consume 30 cc's of fuel. And that's really where the problem is. You see, these results are within the margin error, and we don't have a solid conclusion other than both fuels are about the same. And that kind of makes sense. Diesel fuel is about 139,000 BTUs per gallon, and straight vegetable oil is 130,000 BTUs per gallon. So our 50-50 mix calculates to about 134,500 BTUs per gallon. Theoretically, this number should be a little bit lower than this number, but we're only talking about a few seconds difference. So the right thing to do is to test a larger sample, and we'll do that next time around. But the most important thing to consider on this test rig is the results show virtually no difference in the fuels. So let me paint a scenario where information like this may come in handy. You see, if there ever was a zombie apocalypse, well, we would need to get to the ocean as fast as possible, and that's because zombies don't really like salt water, or that's what I'm told. Anyway, here in Kansas, the ocean's not that close, and I reckon the closest beach would be in the Houston area, and that works out to be about 750 miles away. Now, our little diesel-powered car only gets 71 miles to the gallon, so we wouldn't have enough fuel even if we topped off the 10-gallon fuel tank. Fortunately, on the way to the beach, we could stop off at the supermarket and grab a few gallons of vegetable oil. As it turns out, zombies have no use for this stuff. Now, now if the supermarkets turn out to be a problem, we could always stop at McDonald's and drain their fry oil tanks. During an apocalypse, fuel for a diesel engine is virtually everywhere. And with a bit of luck, we would make it to the ocean with enough fuel to spare. You know, the zombie apocalypse may never happen, but here's something to keep in mind. All the artwork you just saw was generated by AI in less than a minute, so that's a bit disturbing. Anyway, it turns out vegetable oil is a good substitute fuel in an emergency, and we've proven that with our test rig. Now, what other fuels would make decent substitutes? I don't know, but let's find out. But not today. It's too cold. So go ahead and put in the comments what types of fuels or mixtures we should try in our test rig, and we'll give it a shot and report the results. Until then, stay warm, and we'll see you next time.
Okay, make it draw a picture of a robot driving a 64 Cadillac on the beach with a mushroom cloud in the background. Wow.